has guaranteed people the freedom of expression. And I believe the example that I shared with you was in the identification of exactly which night is Laylatul Qadr. And I shared with you one view of some scholars that this night is not even in Ramadan, yet we know from the Quran alone, if we add the Sunnah subhanAllah, it's indisputable evidence that Laylatul Qadr can only be in Ramadan. So we know any view that says it is out of Ramadan is wrong. Yet, this view was documented and recorded. So it is important that we continue to debate these issues. The thing is though, the scholars in the past, brothers and sisters, when they debated issues, in as much as they may not be convinced of the, the opinion of the other person, so in the end they still held on to their position, their opinion, they were still respectful of the view of the other person. So they did not go about saying, you are misguided, you're gonna land in the hellfire, this is kufr, and things like that. I mean, if it's kufr, it's kufr, that's a different issue. But they did not go about labeling, labeling the people that they disagreed with with all these labels that, that seem to be so widespread these days. They were respectful of the views and opinions of others, although they disagreed with them. Now the reality in relation to the issue of should we be following a madhab, the reality is whether we like it or not, brothers and sisters, whatever we choose to do, unless we totally deviate, whatever we choose to do, most likely one of the scholars of the madhahib have already given that opinion. In other words, it's highly unlikely, it's highly unlikely a person cannot be following a madhab. You may not deliberately set out to do so, but inevitably, inevitably, whatever choice a person comes to or makes, chances are that is already a view expressed by one of the different uh, uh, many schools of thought that we have. So this is a reality we need to understand. We may not intend to follow it, but the reality is this was already covered, so to speak. So whether we like it or not, chances are we're already following a method. Now remember, the, the scholars in the past, especially the Imams after whom these schools of thought, uh, are, or to whom these schools of thought are attributed, their intention was never ever to let people come and follow their views and opinions. Their ideas were to help people connect with the Quran and the Sunnah. That was their goal, their objective. They did not formulate a madhab, a school of thought, in order to get people to follow their way, no. Their primary objective was to get the people to follow the way of the Prophet ﷺ. And so the knowledge that they had, they used that to help the people follow the Prophet, the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. That was their objective. And we as Muslims today must understand that that is always the objective. The primary objective of the Muslim, regardless of when we live, is to follow the example of the noble messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Whether you're a Sahabi, or you live 2,000 years or 3,000 years after the Sahaba, that objective is still the same. Every Muslim is obliged to follow the example of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. For those who live with the Prophet, they had the opportunity, mashallah, to directly see him and hear him. While for those who came after, following him means for us that we follow his traditions as it is documented and recorded and verified in what we call the hadith or the sunnah. So we must not lose sight of this objective. So regardless of what we decide to follow, what opinion, even, we, even if we think it's our own opinion, there's a very good chance it's already a view that, was, uh, that is held by one of the schools of thought. Now as to the issue of should we stick to a school of thought firmly regardless 
This is the issue that I believe is more important and more bothersome for us. Now, in order to understand this, we must also understand what is our objective as Muslims. It is to follow the truth. What is the truth? The truth is the Quran and the Sunnah. That's what the truth is. So our goal is to follow the truth wherever we find it. Wherever we find it. In so obliging a person, you know, forcing them to only follow one school of thought is in a way forcing that person to sometimes not follow the truth. Now you might say what? Am I implying that sometimes a madhab may not be following the truth? Well, the issue needs a little bit of explanation. So let me say first of all that as you know very well, there is tremendous dif differences of opinions among the scholars about everything almost in Islam. But when you look at all these differences and the issues that the scholars have differed, the issues boil down to two, two, two types of issues. There are things in which it's a matter of which one is better. And in this, mashallah, you have flexibility. There's no need to fight over, well, you know, this opinion is better than that, so you shouldn't be following that one. You should follow this one. For example, the scholars have differed about which type of Hajj is the best type. The difference is about which one is better. They all agree that whichever type you do, you are performing the obligation of Hajj. No argument there. So the Muslim should never engage in fights over, well, Tamattu is better than Qiran, uh, uh, and Qiran or, or Ifrad is better than Tamattu, and so on. We should not engage in this debate because it's, it's useless. MashaAllah, we have flexibility. In fact, despite this, the, the issue of which type of Hajj is better or best, there may be some people who have no choice. The people of Mecca, for example, they have no choice. They have to perform Hajj Ifrad. So for them, that's the best thing. So there are issues, brothers and sisters, issues that are not about right and wrong or halal and haram, just which one is better. So there is flexibility there. On these issues, and these are numerous, mashaAllah, they're numerous. On these issues, we have flexibility, so it's not a problem. But on issues of right and wrong, issues of halal and haram, Nothing, brothers and sisters, can be right and wrong at the same time. Nothing can be halal and haram at the same time. This is tanaqud. And tanaqud is something you should not find in the sharia ah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This kind of literal or real contradiction. You may find it in something that is man-made, because we don't know everything. But in something that God has legislated, you should never find any tanaqud, any contradiction. So it is impossible that on a, on a, the same thing can be right according to one of you, wrong according to the other of you at the same time. It can't happen. It's either right or wrong. It can't be both at the same time. And you and I as Muslims, we have to realize this. Allah has given us intelligence for a reason. For a reason. Because even the greatest scholar can be mistaken. Because he's the greatest scholar, we assume he can't make mistakes. No, Allah has given us intelligence. And so we need to understand that even the greatest scholar can make a mistake. So when we see it, we shouldn't be hesitant to say, hey, this is, this is a mistake. And we can't do this. However, that does not take away from the stature, mashallah, of the scholar. The fact that a scholar has made a mistake, brothers and sisters, does not take away from his status as a scholar. In fact, it enhances it. It enhances it because it highlights the reality of human nature. That is, we're not perfect and we will make mistakes. This is why all the imams and all the great scholars, if you were to read their, about their lives, you will always find that they make statements that clearly indicate 
that the truth is the Quran and the Sunnah. Now what they're saying, the truth is the Quran and Sunnah. So wherever there is a conflict between the Sunnah or the Quran and what the Imam is saying, they tell us, you follow the Quran and the Sunnah. Al Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, for example, he said, and I'll just share with you statements, two, two statements among the many that he made regarding this issue. Al Imam Abu Hanifa said, "Ida sah al hadith fahuwa madhabi." If the hadith is sahih, that is my madhab, that is my way. Al Imam Abu Shafi said exactly the same words as well when he was the uh, scholar. He said, "Ida sah al hadith fahuwa madhabi." If the hadith is sahih, that is my madhab. Meaning, if you find my opinion contradicting an authentic hadith, what, what do you follow? Not the words of the Imam, but the hadith of the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam. Al-Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, also said, it is not permissible, it is not permissible for a person to follow, to follow my opinions unless he understands the basis on which I made those opinions. In other words, you must understand my arguments, my dalil, my evidence. It is not permissible, he said, not permissible for a person to follow my opinions, my views, unless that person understands the basis on which I came up with those views. That is, they understand my arguments, my proof, my evidence. Because in reality, brothers and sisters, when you understand the proofs that are uh, proposed by a sheikh or an imam or a madhab or whatever, at the end of the day, you can make a choice and a decision as to whether this is what the Prophet ﷺ used to do or not. So you look at the evidence and if you are convinced that the evidence is sound, you follow that view. In reality, you're not following the view of the Imam. You're actually following what you believe is the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And this is what the scholars attempted to do, to help us understand what exactly is the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. So Imam Abu Hanifa never allowed anybody, does not permit anyone to simply go on the basis of his fatwas like that. Imam Abu Hanifa said this and he said that. He says, no, that's not permissible. You have to understand my reasoning, my dalil. What is the evidence that I use? Because in the end, the Imam understood. The wajib, the obligation is not to follow the Imam, but to follow the Prophet So if you accept his evidence, then you are following that. If you think his evidence is not sound, then of course you will not follow that. You will follow hopefully what you believe honestly is authentic from the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam. Al-Imam Malik rahimahullah, this great Imam who lived in Medina and was once the uh, Imam of the Masjid of the Prophet alayhi salam, he said, Kullun yu'khadu min qawlihi wa yurad illa sahiba hadha al-qawl. He said, from everyone we accept and we reject what they say. From every human being, we accept what is acceptable, we reject what is not acceptable. Except, he said, except the companion of this grave, and sitting in the Prophet's masjid, he pointed to the grave of the Prophet Except the companion of this grave, Sahiba had al qabr Meaning, only the Messenger of Allah, we cannot accept and reject. We have to accept everything from him. Again, this Imam is making it clear that not everything he says might be the truth. And so, if people find out, if people find out that, look, something the Imam has said that he's mistaken in, then we are obligated not to follow the Imam. We're obligated to follow the truth, brothers and sisters. And when we understand this, then we understand that to strictly follow one madhab only, regardless of what might come to our attention, is actually wrong. Because in addition to following the truth, we have to understand that it is not possible that one sheikh or one scholar or even one madhab would have encompassed all the sunnah. That's not possible. If it is, 
if one madhab is, is, has encompassed all the sunnah, it would mean that the other madhahib are wrong. And we can't say that. So if one madhab did not collect all the sunnah, it would therefore mean if you literally follow this madhab strictly and never deviate from that, chances are sometimes you might be doing things that, that are not based on sunnah. Let me share with you quickly an incident that happened in the life of Imam Malik that, that highlights this issue for us. Al Imam Malik, when he was alive, he was commissioned by the Khalifa at the time, Al Mansur. This is an Abbasid Khalifa, to write a book on the Sunnah. And so he would write what you and I know as Al Muwatta, considered by some scholars as the first effort ever to compile to compile a book on what is authentic from the Prophet ﷺ, although there are statements that Imam Malik ha has recorded there that are not authentic. But nevertheless, it is the first attempt by any scholar of Islam in one place to collect uh, what is authentic sunnah from the Prophet ﷺ. Now, when Imam Malik finished his collection and presented it to the Khalifa al-Mansur, the Khalifa said to him, what do you think if we were to make this book the madhab of the Islamic world? Everybody's Islam must conform to what you have collected here. If what you're doing does not conform with this book, you have to change. Al-Imam Malik rahimahullah told the Khalifa, you cannot do that. The Khalifa said to him, what do you mean I cannot do that? I am the Khalifa, I have the power. I can do it. Al-Imam Malik rahimahullah told him, no, you, are, you cannot be justified in doing this. The Khalifa asked him why. He said, he said, the people who live in Kufa, they have learned Sunnah from the companions like Abdullah bin Mas'ud and others who settled in Kufa. How can you then force them to give up a Sunnah to follow something else that is Sunnah? When the objective is to follow the Sunnah. And so if a person is already following the Sunnah, why would you force him to give that up to follow something else that is also sunnah? Leave the person alone if he's following sunnah. So he refused to allow his compilation, his book called al muwatta to be used as the yardstick of the kind of Islam people should be practicing. He made it clear that this is based on the knowledge he, had, he was able to collect, mashallah. And his understanding is and was that he could not have possibly collected all the sunnah. So people who have learned from other companions, sunnah, leave them alone. And so in the end, brothers and sisters, our objective should be to follow the sunnah. Now if you are following generally one madhab, and you find in another madhab on a particular issue, a, 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 an opinion that would make life easier for you, then I know people argue, oh, you can't shop around for fatwas, right? But if what you would like to do, brothers and sisters, if it is not based on the desire of a person trying to find an answer to fit what he or she desires, because the scholars have agreed, if anyone is shopping around for fatwa to fit their own desires, this is wrong. This is prohibited. It's not allowed. If, however, a person is seeking to do what is sunnah, what is established in the sunnah, but what will also make life easy for him or her, then the sunnah is, you should go ahead and do that. The Prophet wasalam, when he sent Mu'ad ibn Jabal and Abu Musa al-Ash'ari to Yemen to teach the people Islam, his instructions to them were, as Imam Bukhari tells us in his Sahih, Bashiru, sorry, first of all he said, Yassiru wala tu'asiru. This is his instruction to these two companions, Abu Musa and Mu'ad ibn Jabal, sending them to Yemen. Yassiru wala tu'asiru. Make things easy, facilitate things for people. Don't make things difficult. Wa bashiru wala tu'nafiru. And give people good news. Don't chase them away. So how you approach people and the message you give to them 
should not be a message that would in turn turn them away from Islam, but rather it should give them good news, it should give them hope. It should make them desire it and want it. So this is what the Prophet told us, make things easy. So the sunnah is to make things easy for people. In another hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, Aisha radiallahu anha tells us that the Prophet alayhi salatu was was never given ma khayyira Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam bayna amrayni illa akhtara aysarahuma ma lam yakun fihi ithman. The Prophet, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was never given a choice in any matter or a choice between two things except he always chose the easier option not the more difficult one, the easier one as long as it was not sinful so if a person, brothers and sisters finds in another school of thought an issue that is based on sunnah, mind you has to be based on sunnah that would make life easy for him or her why is it wrong for that person to follow the sunnah when our objective is to follow the sunnah wherever we find it so this hadith proves that the sunnah is, if you find something that's based on sunnah, that's easy for you, alhamdulillah, do it. But the condition is, it must be based on sunnah. Now if, Aisha said, if there was anything sinful in the easier option, the Prophet ﷺ would be the farthest person from that. Ibn Hajar, in commenting on this hadith, he said that if the easier option entails something sinful, then the Prophet ﷺ would choose to do the more difficult option. So we choose the more difficult when the easier option contains or uh, drags us into sinful things. But if it doesn't, if it doesn't take us into sinful things, then the Prophet's choice ﷺ would be to go with the easy, easier option. And so I hope with this, inshallah, this issue would have become clearer for us. Um, at the end of the day, remember that you know, the average person does not have the authority to stand up and give fatwas, but nevertheless, brothers and sisters, Allah has given us intelligence for a reason, and we are required to use it. No one is required to be a scholar of Islam before he or she practices Islam, no. Which means Islam has to remain simple and easy, easily understood for the average person, because it is not realistic that everything we need to do, we have to call up a shaykh and say, what do I do here? What do I do now? What should I do now? Next. This is not possible. It's not realistic. So Allah never intended that we should constantly be asking the scholars, well, tell us what to do now. We are required to know enough to enable us on our own to live, mashallah, and practice. We don't need to be a scholar, with a graduate with a degree in order to practice or to live Islam. Yes, there are issues or details on some issues, that we may need the input of the scholars for. And this is what Allah meant when He said, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ ذِكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask those with knowledge when you don't know. So we're required to have some knowledge. But the in-depth knowledge, not every Muslim is required to have that. The basic knowledge, the basic knowledge, every Muslim is required to have that so that he or she on her, his or her own can properly practice Islam. And, and he or she does not need the scholar or a sheikh to always be there to tell them, okay, make a step now, go to the left now, come back to the right now. No. That is a cult. That is control of people. And Islam is not about control. Islam is about the individual worshiping his creator or her creator, subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of us and open up our hearts and minds so that we can understand this wonderful message he has revealed for mankind. And may he inspire all of us to live by this message. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa